Welcome, everybody. This is so exciting to see people, real people, not Zoom people. This is our first real program, and it's outside, so we can do it. And we, we originally were going to have 100 people here, and we had people signing up like crazy, and then 50 people. And so, but this is a wonderful crowd, and thank you so much for coming out. So today, and thank the Lord for this beautiful weather. This is amazing. I've, we've been thinking about this day for a long time and thinking about 90 degree heat and are we blessed. Um, today, by the way, is Women's Equality Day. I don't know if you all know that, but I just thought I'd let you know. Um, I'm Annie Murphy and I'm the director of the Framingham History Center and I want to welcome you all to Mayo Collins Square and our celebration of 100 years since the adoption of the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution. We are here to honor two Framingham women, Louise Mayo and Josephine Collins, who were jailed for their protests to gain women the vote. Fifteen years ago, when the town of Framingham created Mayo Collins Square, it consisted of a piece of turf not much bigger than a postage stamp, right about there, holding a, the small sign, which now is sort of behind us, uh, with the balloons on it. And um, it always bothered me that that was all there was to honor these two women. So when the road was reconfigured about four years ago, I made sure that this area was reserved here for this day. And here we are. And we are going to be unveiling, yay, we're going to be unveiling a, um, an interpretive panel, which has the story of both these women on it. And actually, I had thought about, you know, statues and public art and everything. And then this really tells the story. And that's what we're here for. Um, so finally, we have this appropriate marker describing who these women were when, and what they did to advance the cause of women's suffrage. We hope that it will serve to introduce Framingham's children, their parents, and grandparents to these seemingly ordinary women who did truly extraordinary things. Women who walked these very same pathways on their way to suffrage meetings at the Village Hall. This is where they got inspired to go down to Washington and into Boston. We hope that by learning more about Louise Mayo and Josephine Collins, young girls and boys will be inspired to fight for causes that are greater than themselves. Perhaps they will join a group like the Framingham's League of Women Voters and work to safeguard the right that these two women fought so passionately for while also advocating for underrepresented and disenfranchised groups. The right to vote should never be taken for granted. And now, these two women's stories will stand as a continual reminder that voting is our one tool to impact our democracy. And as we see in this election year, it is a right that needs to be protected. Before I turn this over to our speakers, I want to thank the newly formed Framingham Center Common Cultural District and the Massachusetts Cultural Council for their partnership in creating this interpretive panel behind us. I also want to thank you, uh, members, donors, and volunteers who make up the Framingham History Center, for your continued support. It's support that allows us to hold events like this. So, true to the examples of the Women we are here to honor today, Framingham has a tradition of electing strong, smart women to represent us at various levels of government. Three of them are with us today, and I would like to introduce Representative Maria Robinson to begin our program with a few remarks. Maria. Thank you so much, Annie, and thank you to all of you for coming out on this beautiful day to celebrate this incredibly important occasion. Um, for someone like me, I've always assumed the ability to vote, the right to vote, and taking that time over this past week to really reflect on how, how much members of our own community fought for me gave me such inspiration to keep fighting for future generations myself. And I, I'm really fortunate to be able to have that privilege by being 
in the House of Representatives, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention some of my incredible um, <laughs> uh, predecessors. Um, one, one of the great things about being in the legislature is that you get to learn about other parts of the state. And I have friends who are running right now to be the very first woman to ever hold a position in the legislature for that seat. And I'm really lucky because a lot of amazing women have held this seat before, whether it was Pam Richardson or Debbie Blummer, or of course the incredible Barbara Gray, whose book sits on my shelf and inspires me every single day to be a better legislator. Um, I'm grateful to the path that they paved for the rest of us all across the Commonwealth to have the bravery to run for office and to sit at the boys' table, uh, and <laughs> which, which we still find ourselves doing today. Um, the other thing that I thought a lot about was how important protest is. Um, nowadays, we sort of quaintly think about what the suffragists did. We think, oh, sure, I'm sure that was sort of hard, but maybe not super inconvenient. But when you look around at the amount of protest on cutting edge issues that are happening here in our community right now, whether it's fighting for climate change, Black Lives Matter, just yesterday to save the United States Postal Service in, in front of the post office, I think it's so important that we acknowledge the important role that our protesters and our community plays in moving the conversation forward. Change is certainly hard. I'm sure that this change was very hard for a lot of people to give women the right to vote in the first place. There, we've, we've heard over the past week rhetoric about how folks want to move back to having a single vote for household where men get to make that decision. I don't think any of us would be super pleased with that. Uh, but I'm inspired by being here in Framingham where people are making a real difference. And so many of the women are making such a huge difference, whether it is our wonderful mayor, Senator Spilka. I, I think about Isabel Pistroni, who created the, the Youth Council. We have so many incredible women leaders here. And I encourage you to go out of your way over the next couple of weeks to find some women-owned businesses here in Framingham to support. They could really use your support at this moment in time more than ever. And they're working incredibly hard. I'm about to go over to Dolce de Leche after this to get a, get a little uh, women-owned business gelato. And I encourage you to join me for that. Um, but that's something tangible that we can do is also continue to vote with our dollars. So thank you so much for being here. I'm grateful to Annie and everything that she does for our community. And looking forward to hearing the other speakers. Uh, our next speaker, Anita Danker. Um, Anita did a program for us in September called In a Grid Cause, Framingham and the Fight for Women's Suffrage. Um, she's written a comprehensive article about suffragists from Framingham, which is going to be in the Historical Journal of Massachusetts in the January issue. And we're very lucky to have uh, a scholar who has researched so comprehensively um, the suffragists from Framingham, Anita. Thank you. Okay. I am truly honored to be with you on this summer evening to celebrate two local women of great courage who played an important part in the long fight for equal rights in the United States. As Annie mentioned, I'm a writer and I'm also a teacher, so I'm going to tell you a story. Not so long before his passing last month, a giant of the civil rights movement who would later be dubbed the conscience of the Congress, Representative John Lewis, famously told of the risks he took fighting for equal rights in the 1960s. But he also spoke passionately about his more recent battles for justice for immigrant families separated at the boundary between the United States and Mexico, asserting that he would go to the border and get arrested again if necessary I am prepared to go to jail, he declared. A little over 100 years ago, in the same spirit, the two suffragists whom we have come together to honor this evening 
Louise Parker Mayo, and Josephine Collins, busy though they were with their personal responsibilities, were also prepared to answer a similar call and to go to jail if necessary to fight for equality in the most basic right that defines a democracy and one that we must always guard vigilantly, the right to vote. But before Louise Mayo marched in Washington and Josephine Collins carried her sign of protest on Boston Common, all of Mills Belch's, Framingham's largely unsung suffragist, was laboring quietly at her typewriter and presiding over meetings that helped change the course of history. Her day job was helping to run the family business, Cherry Meadows Gardens, which was located not far from here on Pleasant Street. But she made the time to serve as the president of the Framingham Equal Suffrage League. And when the membership chose to change affiliation in 1916 and throw their support to the militant wing of the National Women's Party, of the feisty Alice Paul and Lucy Burns, Belches eventually rose to become the leader of the Massachusetts branch. Her portrait, taken during that time period, was placed in the Women of Protest file of the Library of Congress American Memory Collection. She was the only Framingham suffragist to be so honored. At about the same time that Belches was leading suffragist organizations at both local and state levels, noted sculptor Meta Warwick Fuller, who lived with her family on Warren Road, and whose major pieces of public art interpreting African-American experience can be found in Boston, New York, and elsewhere, was contributing her talent to fashioning a highly acclaimed suffrage medallion that was sold at fundraising fairs for the Framingham Equal Suffrage League, of which she was a member. The cast of the medallion is on display here at the Danforth Museum. But long before Mayo and Collins and Belches and Fuller and women of means who provided financial support and used their prominence to give voice to the cause, Julia Ward Howe, whose Battle Hymn of the Republic was reportedly first sung in public here at Plymouth Church, spoke at the suffrage convention held at Harmony Grove on the banks of Farm Pond in 1874, along with such notable reformers as Lucy Stone, Henry Blackwell, and the tireless abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison. Twenty years later, Mary Livermore, Lucy Stone's collaborator in publishing the Women's Journal, out of Boston, presided over the Women's Day celebration at the Chautauqua meeting on Mount Waite. The Boston Globe covered the event and called Livermore's speech that day glowing. And high on the hill across the road, the powerful academic Ellen Hyde presided over the expansion of the Framingham Normal School, dedicated to preparing young women to be teachers. Hyde lobbied hard to have buildings such as Mayo and Crocker Halls named for strong women with strong ties to both the school and the suffrage movement. So the foundation was set long before Louise Mayo, after hearing a convincing speech right here by a leader of the National Women's Party issuing a call to action, decided to go to Washington in 1917 to demonstrate her support for the cause. Born Louise Parker, she had studied at Framingham Normal School, class of 1887, and worked as a school teacher before her marriage to William Mayo. They moved to a dairy farm on Nixon Road where they raised their large family. Although small in stature, Mayo frequently steered a horse-drawn school bus around town to supplement the family income. She was active in a number of community organizations, including the PTA, the Improvement Society, and of course, local suffrage groups, which frequently met in her home. When she considered going to Washington, her oldest daughter, Catherine, agreed to run the household and care for the younger children while her mother was out of town. Mayo marched in front of the White House in the famous Bastille Day demonstration of 1917 and was arrested with 15 others for this act of defiance. She refused to pay the $25 fine 
and was sent to the infamous Okoquan Workhouse, where National Women's Party leaders would later endure beatings and forced feedings during their time behind bars. President Wilson was probably embarrassed, as well he should have been, by the arrest of ordinary American women peacefully demonstrating for equal rights. He hastily issued pardons. Mayo quietly returned home to get back to work, making jam and caring for her family. In an interview for a Boston newspaper after her return, Mayo recounted being worried about how her children were faring in her absence, but she had few complaints other than that she missed her toothbrush and milk and sugar in her coffee. Louise Mayo did not dwell on her suffrage activism in her later years, but she never lost her activist spirit. She encouraged family members to become educated, to get involved, to take action, in the hope that there would be revolutionaries in future generations of her family. Two years later, in 1919, Josephine Collins also participated in a historic protest demonstration not long before the passage of the 19th Amendment, for which she too was arrested. She was born in 1880, the eldest daughter of Irish immigrants. Collins and her six siblings grew up right here on Salem End Road. Little is known about her early life, but she must have been a resourceful individual because she found a variety of ways to support herself throughout her life, working as a nanny in Rhode Island, helping with the family market here in town, and opening a variety of businesses, including a fabric store, a periodical shop, and a tea room. She believed, however, that her enterprises sometimes suffered after she became involved in the suffrage movement due to pressure exerted by unhappy husbands who did not approve of their wives frequenting her establishments. Collins became active on the local suffrage scene at the, and also at the state level in her role as secretary of the Massachusetts branch of the National Woman's Party. In February 1919, when President Wilson came to Boston on his way home from his peacemaking efforts in France, she signed on to participate in a mass meeting to be held on the Common to protest his lukewarm endorsement of the suffrage amendment. The Women's Party argued that he would have a much better chance of achieving his goal of spreading democracy throughout the world if he paid a little more attention to it here at home. Josephine Collins and 21 others gathered near the State House to make their case on February 24th, but were ordered by, ordered by Boston police officers to disperse for fear they would disgrace the city. When they refused, 16 of them were hauled off to Charles Street Jail. Collins carried a sign that read, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? Alice Paul protested that they were held in solitary confinement and were never given the fresh clothing and personal items that their families had sent for them. Most did not complain and did needlework to pass the time. Three days later, much to her displeasure, Collins was released. Reports concerning who paid her fine are conflicting, but Boston Globe accounts of her discharge claim that Miss Josephine Collins of Framingham left involuntarily soon after 2 p.m., her brother having paid her fine against her protests. She reportedly resisted so strenuously that officers had to forcibly eject her from jail and toss both her and her suitcase into her brother's automobile. Now Collins eventually reconciled with her brother. In her later years, she worked as a bookkeeper at Babson College and talked openly about her suffrage experiences. She was quick to remind female family members and friends to vote in upcoming elections, a right that she and many others had fought so hard to secure. In all, about 500 women were arrested during the demonstrations in D.C. and Boston, but only 167 actually served prison sentences, among them Mayo and Collins, who were awarded the commemorative jailhouse door pins by Alice Paul and the National Women's Party for their heroism and their sacrifice. When John Lewis was asked by reporters why he was smiling in mugshots after his many arrests. He replied simply, it was because he knew that he was on the right side of history. 
I think the same can be said for our two honorees this evening, Louise Parker Mayo and Josephine Collins, and countless other grassroots suffragists from across this nation were willing to interrupt their everyday lives and take the extraordinary step of putting their freedom on the line to challenge a government that denied them and all other American women the right to vote. They did it because they too knew they were on the right side of history. Thank you, Anita. That was terrific. Um, so next up, we have a special visitor, John Chamberlain, who is the great-grandson of Louise Mayo. And John is driven all the way up from Virginia this morning. He started out at 5 p.m. to be here. And a negative COVID test so that he could cross over <laughs> into Massachusetts. So um, we're so honored to have him here. And um, welcome, John. Today, um, there's still so much work to be done. Uh, one of my, my day job is to collect a database of all the elected officials in the United States. And uh, there's some members of the uh, audience here today who are in our database. And uh, thank you so much uh, for giving us the right information. But uh, when I first started working on Congress and the state legislatures, there was only about 9% of women in the U.S. Congress. And today we have nearly 25% of women in the U.S. Congress and 325 women have served and 100 women are serving today in our uh, United States Congress. So I think the work that started here is, is really having an impact and a, a long-term uh, long impact. Uh, I want to tell a little local story because um, this is not uh, scholarly, um, but I hope you'll give me some forbearance on this, but it's, uh, it's colloquial. I was walking on the third base line of Fenway Park, and it was uh, just a few years ago now, and even though I was born in Boston, I had never been to Fenway. And I was really wrapped up in emotion about standing beneath the green big green monster. And I got my picture taken with the big-headed monster. And, and, and then I was, I was kind of walking back toward home plate. And I saw a guy with a, a, a Pan Mass Challenge logo on his, on his uh, polo shirt. And I'm a cyclist, and I, uh, so I, I recognize it. And I, and I said to him, total stranger, I said to him, um, are you a cyclist? And he said, as a matter of fact, I am. How did you know that? And I said, well, you're, you're wearing a, you know, the Pan Mass Challenge. It's a big deal, and I've been privileged to, to be a member of a team that, that raised money for, for the Pan Mass Challenge. And I realized that the woman standing next to him wasn't looking at my face. She was looking at my lapel pin, which is this lapel pin for women's suffrage. And uh, she said, where did you get that? And I said, well, my great-grandmother was a, was a suffragist. And without missing a beat, she said, was her name Louise Parker Mayo? And all of a sudden, three total strangers were hugging each other on the third base line. It was, it was the most extraordinary thing. Uh, and Senator uh, Spilka is here. And, uh, and I want to thank you for that wonderful moment. And uh, it just let us realize that uh, the suffrage movement really brings strangers together and it allows us to be in solidarity instantly around this mission and this cause. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, my mother, who has just passed on July 23rd, uh, was the granddaughter of Louise Parker Mayo. And uh, she, in 2004, 
she wrote a letter to my son, who was a teenager at the time, 16 years ago now, and she wanted to pass on the legacy of Louise Parker Mayo to this next generation. So um, she went to him directly. And uh, this, is, this is what she wrote to him. I'm just going to read a couple of paragraphs, if, if that's okay. And um, she wrote, I'm writing to pass on to you what my family has told me about my grandmother's contribution to the women's suffrage movement. I believe you are exactly the kind of person she had in mind when she worked so hard to promote the passage of the suffrage amendment in Constitution to the United States to allow women the right to vote. You are a boy becoming a man who is willing to use his mind, work hard, and yet hold to a high standard of fairness and teamwork to make real contribution to life. Setting the bar high. Yeah. You would be unwilling because of her legacy to gain an advantage just because you are a male. Well, today that boy is 33 years old, and with his wife, Caitlin, they have a two-and-a-half-year-old girl named Lydia Joan who will carry on the Mayo legacy, I assure you. I'm so glad that, as her grandfather, I'm getting to know her now because she's really a badass. I mean, she's going she's gonna to own something. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really thankful that uh, <clears throat> we're friends now and we can always rely on that later. I do want to talk a little bit about the pin um, because that's been something that ever since uh, it, it became widely available, uh, we bought them and distributed them to everyone in our family. And I, I wear them and that's why I met Senator uh, that was those few years ago. So um, one of the things that the pin is there as a reminder to us of many things, some serious and some funny. One of them is that while Grandma was in Washington, members of the press wanted all kinds of information about our family. They even broke into the house and stole pictures off of her dresser and published them in the local newspaper. Um, so they learned that uh, one of Grandma's own grandmothers had been a Unitarian minister in Maine, certainly not a conventional role for a woman in that time. And they also learned that one of Louise Parker Mayo's relatives was Captain John Parker, an officer of the American Revolutionary Army. And family tradition has it that the sculptor who did the Minuteman in Lexington Common, or I miss it, maybe it's Concord. Is it Concord? It's in Concord. Uh, worked from a painting of that Parker. So we're descended from good, good cloth. My mother always used to say it was by no means ordinary cloth. Um, one of the things that Grandma did not want to have happen was that any of us would rest on our laurels about what she had helped to achieve in her own generation. And I think it was said earlier, and, and I will echo this again, that she hoped that there would be a revolutionary in each generation of our family. And I've always told my older brother that that part was up to him. Um, I'm so thankful to be here for all the hard work that's been done uh, for this wonderful new uh, commemorative plaque and bless all of you for all that you do every day. Thank you. Thank you, John. And now we have a member of Josephine Cullen's family, Carol Kane, who is the great niece of um, Josephine. And Carol has, as long as I've been in the executive director, Carol has been here. She has come every year to put the gold and purple balloons on this sign. Um, and she was here during the dedication and prior to that as well. She is a wonderful standard bearer for the suffrage movement. And we're so lucky to have her here. And come on up, Carol.
Thank you, Annie. <laughs> I wanted to say it's great to see everyone at this event today to celebrate August 26th, the 100th anniversary of the women's right to vote. And I wanted to share another date in August that has significance. On August 5th, 1879, Josephine Collins was born. Thanks to the great writings and presentations of Anita Danker and the fabulous portrayals by Libby Frank, we've had the benefit of knowing Josephine the Suffragette. But I wanted you to know that Josephine was not defined only by her suffrage activities. She was a daughter, a sister, an aunt, a great aunt, a friend to many. She took care of her family and she reached out to others that were in need. So today as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of Women's Right to Vote, I'd like to thank Josephine the person, my great aunt, who did so much for so many. Happy anniversary and thank you so much. So special to have family members with us today. And now um, I'd like to introduce uh, Senate President Karen Spilka, who will say a few words um, as well. Thank you for inviting me to the Suffrage 100 celebration. Let me begin by wishing everyone here and who might be watching on cable a very happy Women's Equality Day. Yes, you can clap for that. So last Tuesday, August 18th, we celebrated the ratification of the 19th Amendment. And it was a hundred years ago that the men of that time finally got around to adopting the amendment as we voted on it as part of our Constitution, as we know, giving women the right to vote. After more than 70 years of struggling, of organizing, of marching, of protesting, and of picketing, and that was the first time anybody had picketed the White House, by the way, and it wasn't exactly appreciated, yeah, as we know, but picketing by generations of courageous women across our great nation. I'd like to thank the organizers of this event, Annie Murphy, for all that you do for this, as well as for the Framingham History Center in Framingham. To Christine Tibor, the board chair of the Framingham History Center, I saw you, Christine, and the other members of the board. And I'd like to acknowledge my women colleague in public service that I've seen here, uh, State Rep. Maria Robinson, and Mayor Yvonne Spicer. And I'd like to give special recognition to the family members of Josephine Collins, Carol Kane, it was great to hear from you, and the family of Louisa Parker Mayer, Mayo. So it was really amazing how we spied each other and how we connected. Um, and I, I think that that is great. You know, I, I think uh, in explaining, I'll never forget his face when I said, well, he said, well, how do you know about the pin? Well, I, I'm a state senator and I represent, at that point, it was the town of Framingham. And there are two tremendously, you know, courageous, great women from Framingham who fought, blah, blah, blah. And when I mentioned their, their names, I remember John's face lit up and he said, wow, Louise Parker Mayo is my great grandmother. <laughs> it was so funny. What a total surprise, but it was great. And John subsequently sent me a wonderful follow-up letter, which was so inspirational with information about his great-grandmother. And uh, as you know, uh, Louise Parker Mayo said at the time, as was noted, there should be one revolutionary in each generation of a family. I hope and I believe with your granddaughter, the family tradition is continuing. But I would like to am amend her words ever so slightly and say at least one revolutionary in each generation of a family. 
So as you're hearing this afternoon, Mayo and Collins played a significant role in securing women's right to vote. And they were jailed for fighting for what they believe in. And I also wear the Jailed for Freedom pin quite regularly. Mayo and Collins were that rebellion that more than 100 years earlier than that, Abigail Ammon Adams promised her husband, if you remember when she said, remember the ladies. But she also said, if you don't, there will be a rebellion. We will rise up and foment a rebellion. And Abigail was not messing around. I love Abigail, by the way. And even more importantly, she was right. But it's important to remember that Abigail's promised rebellion did not end with the victory of the 19th Amendment. As a New York Times editorial put it recently, the 19th Amendment can fairly be seen as an important milestone in an unfinished journey. So as we celebrate, we need to also reflect and recognize the fact that women of color who marched side by side with white suffragists waited decades longer to see their right to vote fully realized. And as we celebrate, let us also recognize that the fight for true equality and access to the ballot are very much a part of our lives still today. From our positions of rel relative privilege and power, the sacrifices that the suffragettes made can seem like ancient history. But Josephine Collins died in 1961. That flips me out because it was after I was born. Their history is our history. In fact, it is our recent history, and women's history is Massachusetts history. That's why I was so pleased when the Framingham History Center included the Jailed for Freedom pin in its top 10 exhibit that opened last fall. And I happen to have, as I said, one of those pins. And for the exhibit, the History Center asked me to comment on the significance of the pin. My comment appears in the exhibit, but I'd like to close with it. More than a century after Mayo and Collins were imprisoned, their battle for gender equality continues. Now the future of our Commonwealth and our country lies in the hands of the many, many dedicated, inspired, and passionate women who have chosen to run for office themselves. I'm proud to celebrate our right to not just vote, but to lead. Thank you, and please, in honor of Collins and Mayo, remember to vote. Vote. September 1st, vote November 3rd, and please persist. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Spilka. Apparently, um, she came out from her staycation for this event, so I really appreciate it. Okay, finally, another very spirited woman and powerful Yvonne Spicer, our current mayor of Framingham, will close out this program. So Mayor Spicer, thank you. Good evening, all. There's so much to be said about women's rights and these, these women that took their badge of courage and said, you know what, we're not gonna give up. We're gonna go get in some good trouble and we're not going to give up. We're going to keep fighting. And I mean, imagine to be fighting to get back into jail. That's pretty powerful. But as Senator Spilka so eloquently stated, a hundred years ago, the right to vote was for some women. And women of color, men of color, did not get a chance to vote until August 6, 1965. So, 
Doing the math, when I was born, my parents did not have the right to vote in this country. And to see what has happened since that time, we've made a lot of progress with voting, but we've also taken some steps back. And it's so imperatively important that we continue to fight for that right to vote. And that's the right for any and everyone, no matter where you are, to be able to vote without impunity, without fear of being attacked, without fear of for your life. We are in some very unprecedented times. And I sometimes hearken back to a hundred years ago. Only thing is different is the time. They fought, they were jailed, they were beaten. But we have to say we can do better, especially here in the United States of America, where we pride ourselves on being a democracy. I'm grateful for all of the women's shoulders that I stand on. Fannie Lou Hamer, Shirley Chisholm, who happens to be my congresswoman I had when I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Um, there's so many of them. And part of that is that as I rise, I have to bring others along. And that's part of what Senator Spilka and uh, Representative Robinson, to inspire on other young women to be their best, to pass that baton to them, to let them know that they have some shoulders they can stand on. And that's what I hope to be, and that's what I want for our city of Framingham, is that to continue to be a beacon of light. And as always, women lead. Women make the difference. Sorry, gentlemen, but I just had to let them know. Women have always been doing the thing. They're going to keep doing the thing. So with that being said, I am deeply honored to be able to unveil this wonderful new plaque. I mean, to honor these women in the city of Framingham is a great thing for us. And, uh, and I'm honored to be here to unveil it. So let's do this together.